Welcome, everybody. Um, good morning and good afternoon, um, depending on where you are based in right now. Uh, so on behalf of the newly established uh, UNEP Copenhagen Climate Center, I would like to invite you and uh, welcome you to attend this uh, um, webinar to launch our new publication, Climate Change Business Risks and uh, Opportunities. Um, focusing the role of private sector adaptation. So before we start our session, I'd like to introduce you a few rules. So first of all, I want to inform you that we will record this webinar. And if you have questions or comments uh, during the speeches and the presentations, place your the question mark on your screen to leave your questions. We will have a chance to uh, discuss them during the Q&A session. Okay, let's start. Um, my name is Jing Jing Gao, and I'm a researcher and a climate adaptation advisor at UNEP CCC. And I work in the field of climate adaptation and the private sector, as well as adaptation transparency. I'm also the co-author of this publication. Uh, so UNEP CCC is a, a leading international advisory institution of energy, climate, and the sustainable development. And it is um, engaged in implementing UNEP's climate change strategy and the energy program. We're focusing on um, assisting developing countries and emerging economies transition towards low carbon and uh, climate resilience development. Uh, one field we work in is um, uh, the private sector's engagement in climate change, which is also the topic today. So now I'd, I'd like to introduce you uh, the program today. In the first segment, uh, we'd like to invite the two speakers, uh, Ms. Chen, uh, sorry, Ms. Yan Chen and Mr. Elliot Panay, to give short remarks, highlighting the two perspectives of uh, today's topic. Uh, and then in the second segment, uh, the authors of this publication, my colleague Elizabeth Rush and myself, will walk you through the key findings. Um, and finally, we will open the floor for questions and the comments um, to discuss uh, the topic of today and to try to interact with our panelists, including our speakers and the lead authors of this work. So um, with that, I'd like to invite Ms. Yan Chen and to speak to the support for SMEs in adapting to climate change um, with their empirical work from one of the existing tools for SMEs in assessing in their uh, climate risks. Um, Yan is the advisor uh, with the GIS. Um, she leads the green economy team. Her area of expertise, including green private sector development, uh, climate change adaptation, resource efficiency, and so on. Yan has also worked on regional economy integration, trade in service, and SMEs development in different developing countries. Welcome, Yu Yan. Thank you very much, Jing Jing, for the introduction. And special thanks, of course, also to UNEP CCC for inviting me to speak on behalf of GIZ. Um, before I dive into the role of private sector adaptation and the GIZ climate expert approach, um, let me explain a little bit more on where I'm coming from within GIZ. As already mentioned, I'm part of the green economy team and our goal is basically to harness the role of the private sector as a major driver of the transformation towards a green and inclusive economy. So now you might ask, okay, what does it actually mean? What we do is we focus mostly on green private sector development, which we define as conducive to maintaining healthy ecosystems, more resource efficient and less pollutive, as well as low carbon and climate resilience, while at the same time, of course, creating economic opportunities at scale, including income and employment generation, but also um, the provision of essential goods and services. Climate resilience and adaptation is of special importance here, particularly from a climate justice point of view. If we look at global economic losses from climate disasters, they've been increasing drastically within the last years. 
And according to recent estimates, we're talking about a current average of 300 billion US dollars per year. Because of their geographical location and also their weak infrastructure, developing and emerging countries bear a very high share of these consequences of rising temperatures, seasonal irregularities, and extreme weather events such as heavy rains, floods, or droughts. And this, even though most of them contribute less than yeah, 0.1% to global annual CO2 emissions. For developing countries, there is a crucial need for all economic sectors and companies to adapt to the unavoidable consequences of climate change to avoid exactly this, these potential economic losses. And this is even more important for SMEs because, as we like to say in private sector development, they form the backbone of our partner economies. So climate change adaptation is important um, so that it will not threaten productivity, competitiveness, and ultimately the capacity of the private sector to support the livelihoods of people through income generation and employment. Um, however, in the international discourse on climate change, the private sector is often viewed as either the main source of emissions, so there's a major focus on carbon reduction and mitigation targets, or as a potential source of funding for adaptation and mitigation measures. But what is overlooked here is how business models in the private sector are impacted by climate change. SMEs are exposed to various climate change risks. Um, typically, the focus here is on direct physical risks, which means operational impacts, um, such as damage on assets, um, disruption of production processes. We are basically talking about things like machine overheating or yeah, decrease of staff productivity due to extreme heat. Um, but companies can also be indirectly affected as yeah, resources such as water and energy become more scarce, therefore also more expensive, and we see a lot of supply chain disruption here. And then lastly, there's also um, transition risks, um, which is mostly related to yeah, changes in technology, markets and regulations, and also a potential liability for emissions in the future. This is the vulnerability side of yeah, adaptation. But what we like to stress, um, especially when we work with small and medium enterprises, is that climate change will also create a lot of business opportunities. So there will be a rising demand for products and services um, such as efficiency technologies, insulation material, other climate resilient um, yeah, construction material, and also consulting services because there is a pretty large knowledge gap here. Currently, SMEs in developing countries are not very well equipped in dealing with these challenges. Um, most of them already have very few human and financial resources at hand. Um, most of them are basically unaware of the risks and opportunities involved. And what we find is that there's often no um, supporting structure from either the government or the private sector. So we don't see a lot of chambers, business associations, or other business development services providers focus on the topic of climate adaptation. Um, so it is against this backdrop that our Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development has decided to commission a project, a global project, that focused entirely on the topic of private sector adaptation to climate change. Um, it was a project that was running from 2014 until roughly 2017 and 18, and it focused on four pilot countries. The goal was to create, on the one hand, awareness on the topic of climate adaptation, but also to identify, test, and scale different approaches. Um, and while there were different approaches and instruments used in different country contexts, they realized that there were a lot of similarities when it came to facilitating awareness raising and also um, supporting businesses in becoming yeah, more aware and uh, in developing adaptation strategies. What came out of this process um, is basically our climate expert tool, which is featured in the publication authored by Jingjing and Elizabeth. It consists of a very simple and straightforward five-step approach that is supported by an Excel-based planning tool uh, where we can just simply insert numbers. It starts out with the identification of climate change phenomena and their impacts, usually from a country perspective. 
And then the next step is to assess the company specific risks and opportunities involved. Um, and then to identify and prioritize adaptation measures. Um, the third step is done through a cost benefit analysis, which is at the heart of our climate expert tool. And um, what comes out as the final output is a climate change adaptation strategy and also various supporting documents, such as a communication strategy. And recently, as we've been updating the tool, we have added a fifth step, um, which is on the topic of adaptation finance. Um, so we saw the need to support SMEs in identifying the right financing options for each of the adaptation measures in their strategies. Um, in, in working with SMEs, I think it is very important to somehow strike a balance between a tool that is easy to understand and very user-friendly and yet complex enough to catch, yeah, to capture all the relevant aspects. Um, with the climate expert approach, I believe we have a very versatile instrument. I mean, currently we use it for, we use it for stakeholder awareness raising. We use it to conduct um, direct company assessments. Um, but the most important part of this approach is um, that we also use it as part of a training of consultants approach. And this is very important to promote knowledge transfer. In terms of impact, um, I think the climate expert has been very successful in building awareness around climate change and how it impacts business as usual in developing countries. Um, a lot of the SMEs go through the entire process and they come out with a proper adaptation plan and a series of measures to implement in the short, medium and long run. Um, but the challenge is really like, OK, what is the actual uptake? And um, yeah. And how far are companies actually implementing the measures? When we take a closer look here, we realize that um, yeah, uptake is fairly low, especially when it comes to more costly adaptation measures. Um, I believe that yeah, there are three major challenges that um, we need to tackle and that um, yeah, we should address more strongly in international development. Um, first and foremost, um, I think working with the climate expert for five years, we realized awareness raising is good, but it's really not enough. We need a stronger business case. And the business case is very much related to the availability of data. In most of the contexts we work in, it is already difficult enough to get data. But what we actually need then is very reliable, regional, country-specific, ideally localized climate data. Um, there's just too much uncertainty around the numbers and the projections we use. And therefore, the cost of non-adaptation is also very uncertain for the SMEs, which understandably prevents them from taking action. Then the second challenge is um, SMEs need a lot of handholding to do this analysis and to implement the more technical parts of adaptation. At the same time, we observe that there is an unwillingness or a hesitance to pay. Um, while we're currently still rolling out our training of consultants approach to create this knowledge base and to support BDSP on the ground, in the future, I believe, we really need to focus more strongly on strengthening service markets for climate adaptation. And um, last but not least, but it's probably not a big surprise, um, the topic of adaptation finance is a major hurdle. Um, when we talk about SMEs and private sector adaptation, a major lever will be greening financial institutions so that they take climate risks into account and so that SMEs are able to easier access finance for adaptation measures. Um, I believe there's still a big construction side there. and. Also for development projects, it's challenging sometimes because we have this differentiation between technical and financial assistance. Um, yes, all right. Um, this is where I'd like to end my input. Um, however, I'm sure we'll be able to um, go into a few more details later on during the Q&A. And I think some of the challenges I mentioned, they're also picked up by Elizabeth during her presentation. So yeah, I look forward to that. And over to you again, Jingjing. Thank you very much, Yan. Uh, following Yan's remarks on supporting private sector with the adaptation tools, um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Elliot Panay to speak to insurance industry's engagement in the climate change adaptation. Elliot is a business developer at uh, Axa Climate, 
which is the Action Group's Center of Expertise for Climate and the Biodiversity, aiming at bringing together the worlds of insurance and adaptation. Alut also leads Action's involvement in the Insurance Development Forum in building new insurance schemes worldwide to protect the most vulnerable communities. Alut, please tell us about Action's practice. Thank you, uh, Jing Jing, and um, thank you to um, the UN, UNEP uh, CCC team for organizing this conference, and uh, to Elizabeth as well, Aris on the technical side, and to uh, uh, all of you who joined today. So, indeed, my name is uh, Elliot, and I work at um, AXA Climate, which is a, a branch of AXA Group, the global insurer, specialized in uh, climate adaptation services. So, when we were launched, I think, five years ago at AXA Climate, Our first ambition was to enter what we call the parametric insurance industry. So I don't know who is familiar among you with uh, the principle of parametric insurance. So maybe I, I should quickly explain what it is. Uh, parametric insurance is probably uh, the, the biggest uh, innovation of the insurance industry in the last uh, 15 years, which is not so difficult because we are not a very uh, innovative industry, I would say. But, uh, The principle is that in case of a major natural disaster, such as a flood, a heat wave, a major drought, rather than sending a loss uh, assessor on site to find out more about the financial loss, try to negotiate with the clients and possibly reduce the amount of the payouts to the clients, here with parametric insurance, it is satellite data or local data that assesses the amount of the loss. And so when you have a disaster, you can pay within hours uh, a, a sum to your clients. Uh, let me give you an example. In uh, in 2021, for those who remember, it's not that far ago, uh, in Haiti, there was a major earthquake of more than seven of magnitude. And, uh, and the international reinsurance community, among uh, which uh, Access Climate was, was, was a part, managed to send a payout of several uh, dozen millions of dollars to IET within 36 hours, at least for the exact climate parts. So it gives you an idea before it could take uh, months or even years sometime, sometimes to get an insurance payout. And with parametric insurance, you get the money very quickly, which allows you to engage with your restoration activities and uh, also very transparently because you agree upfront with your clients And you say that, uh, for instance, if there is one meter of, uh, of water in the city, the payout would be uh, 1 million. If it's a category three cyclone that crosses a circle around the insured location, then it's a payout of uh, 1 million, for instance. Uh, so that's, uh, that's really the, the idea of parametric insurance. And of course, it's been, uh, it's been surging in the last years because of its speed, because of its objectivity. And paradoxically, So it's, it's innovative, it's, uh, it's an innovation, but it has met a greater success in the developing world rather than in the developed countries. And I think the two reasons for, two main reasons uh, for this are that the, the insurance industry is very mature in the, in, in the developed countries. And so there's a bit of reluctance to go for, for new uh, approaches. And the second reason is, of course, that developed countries often do not need to get insured themselves And they can, uh, at least as I'm speaking for the public sector side, they, uh, they have, uh, you know, national funds to, to pay for this kind of natural damages. But it's a, it's a bit like, uh, still, it's a bit like uh, with the mobile phone technology, you know, some uh, developing countries went from uh, having no way of communication uh, to mobile phone uh, without, uh, without the intermediate step that we took with uh, the fixed lines. So that's, that's was it for parametric insurance. So that's the, the, the big innovation of, uh, of insurance and an example of how the private sector looks at the adaptation opportunities and the, the climate risks, let's say. But what is more interesting, interesting and I think also the reason why uh, I have the, the chance to, to, to speak today is that uh, Accept Climate is a player that tries to really match together insurance and adaptation. Because usually it's two different worlds. You have the insurer that uh, insure the clients and take a fraction of their financial risks. And then you have the consultants that try to uh, give ways to clients to adapt against uh, in the face of uh, rising climate risks, let's say. And so we really try to, to do the two. And uh, today, I think insurance makes up about, or last year, I think it made about like uh, 
90% of our revenues. And for this year, the target is that insurance should only make 50% of our revenues and the remaining part should be adaptation services. So what, what we want to do is to be able to meet for all clients, uh, for both public and private clients, corporates, uh, cities, countries, we want to be able to tell them, okay, uh, first, let's understand your risk together. Then we'll find ways to reduce your risk. And then if you want, and only if, we, if you want, we can ensure the residual proportion of your risk. And so that's a complete change of, uh, of approach for, for an insurer. And I think that there are two main reasons uh, for, for this change. The first one, the, the, the two complementary reasons. The first one is that uh, we are more and more committed and uh, at Axel Climate, for instance, I think the average age is uh, 33. So we are all engaged for climate and we really want to help communities become more resilient. And the less official reason is that we simply want to keep our job because uh, I don't know if some of you remember the a little sentence from uh, AXA's previous CEO before COP21, who said, uh, a world uh, with plus two degrees is still insurable, whereas a world with plus uh, four degrees is not insurable anymore. So that means that if climate risks increase too much, uh, insurers will lose their jobs because uh, the losses will be so high that uh, it won't be insurable anymore because the premiums level would be too high. And so nobody would, would get insured. So it's also a way for us to survive, to say, okay, let's reduce the risks uh, of our clients. And uh, now how we do, how do we do this? So it's a bit similar actually in some regards uh, to what uh, Jan presented uh, in the previous uh, in intervention. But what we do is basically a three step approach. The first step is helping our clients to understand their risks. So basically, we, we work mostly for private firms uh, as of now, or impact, uh, impact funds, uh, investment funds. And we, we say, OK, here's your portfolio. You have uh, 2,000 assets. Let's screen them. Let's do a climate risk screening, as we call it. And we are able to say, OK, out of these, uh, 13 assets or 20 assets are at high risk of a planet, like a physical climate risk, let's say. So it goes from risk of floods to risk of a heat wave, risk of flood, uh, of a frost, uh, extreme wind, uh, cyclones, uh, etc. And then we can make some deep dives uh, to, to propose some adaptation measures. But the first step is really understand your risk and understand the risk of the client and really quantify the risk. So what is interesting is that some people think that uh, the risk, uh, I mean, they have an informal already knowledge of the risk. But it's uh, really important to go from an informal knowledge to uh, a quantified knowledge of the risk, both today uh, and in, you know, in the future with the climate change scenarios. So what we do is that we do some multimodal averages from the IPCC hypothesis. And uh, we say, okay, what is the risk today? What is the risk in 2030, in 2050? What is the risk under uh, uh, a very pessimistic climate change scenario? What is the risk in an optimistic climate change scenario? And we put this in reports for our clients. So that's the first step. The second step is once we have understood the risk, how do we adapt uh, in the face of this risk? And so what we do usually is that we shortlist some adaptation measures and we try to, we try to prioritize them. So as Jin Jin said, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm responsible at Axel Climate for an initiative for cities. And so we work at the city scale, not only at the you know, portfolio scale of uh, investors. And so for cities, for instance, the, the adaptation measures that we can recommend uh, range from planting trees in the streets, planting mangroves on the coast to break the waves and prevent flooding, uh, uh, making the city uh, greener and uh, and the soil a bit rougher so that it limits the speed of the flow of water in case of a flood, uh, digging some retention basins, etc. So we put all these measures and now we say, okay, how should we prioritize them? And for this, a uh, bit like, like uh, what Jan presented, we, we perform some uh, cost-benefit analysis. We look at the, the cost of the measures and we look at their benefits in terms of the risk reduction that it allows. Uh, and so the average loss that every year the community or the business will save if they put in place the adaptation measures. And so that's, a, that's an interesting way to speak at uh, not, a, not so much at the heart of the people that need to adapt, but rather at their wallet. And uh, that's really 
how you convince people, you, you show them that uh, really it's cost efficient to, to adapt. Um, okay, and the last step, so I, I need to, to speak uh, maybe a bit about, uh, about insurance, is that if the country, if the business, uh, if the impact fund uh, desires so, we can help them to reduce the risk thanks to adaptation and then ensure the residual portion of the risk. And so, of course, we can, uh, sometimes adaptation takes a bit of time, and so we can start by insuring the client straight away and then limit the premium year after year as the client adapts. And so that's also what makes, uh, you know, us uh, very, uh, uh, let's say, um, credible, is that uh, if we say to the client upfront that by planting mangroves, uh, its risk uh, will reduce by 30%, then if the client follows our advice and plants mangroves, we will have to, we will have us, insurers, to reduce the premium we charge to the clients by 30% as well. So that makes us very credible. If we say something up front, we respect it as a risk taker uh, um, after. Uh, so um, one last word, perhaps, uh, to, to close really with the topic of today about, uh, you know, opportunities for, for businesses in the adaptation world. So I think, of course, there are plenty of opportunities but also obstacles to uh, the acceleration of, uh, of, um, of adaptation. I think there are, of course, on the, on the, on the public side, there is a, a main gap, a main uh, break that is um, budget, of course. But I think there are two common gaps between the public and private uh, uh, for adapting uh, towards, uh, towards uh, natural risks. And I think, and I fully, fully agree with Jan, it's uh, mainly um, lack of knowledge and uh, lack of uh, willingness to pay. And the, what is interesting is that uh, those reasons are complementary because uh, when you don't know that you need to adapt, when you haven't realized that it was cost efficient to adapt, you're not ready to pay to, to, to adapt yourself. And so this is why such, uh, such events are, are very helpful to communicate uh, about, uh, about the needs. And, uh, and I think also that the regulation will play a big role in the coming years, and that the players that made the efforts upfront to adapt uh, will be ahead of the, of the, if I may say so, the adaptation uh, journey. Uh, I think that's it. Happy to take your questions uh, after, and thank you very much again for uh, the opportunity. Thank you very much, Elliot, and also for you, Ian. So now uh, let's move to the next. And together with my uh, UNEP CCC colleague Elizabeth, um, I will we will briefly present the work um, um, from this uh, from this publication. But before we start, let me just uh, briefly introduce you, uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a senior finance project manager. She consults the uh, development of finance institutions on climate risks and uh, um, how to uh, decarbonize their uh, portfolios. She is also part of the finance expert pool of the NDC uh, Action Project, uh, which seeks to support the implementation of developing countries' NDCs. Uh, with investment plans and the finance strategies. So, as I mentioned earlier, private sector's engagement in adaptation is uh, um, one of the fields that we work at UNEP CCC. So, to anticipate climate impact and uh, take earlier actions to pre prevent losses and damages, Adaptation by private sector is very essential for their businesses. Um, although those climate impacts uh, pose both risks and opportunities, uh, um, however, many businesses still tend to um, underestimate their exposure to climate risks. Um, well, on the other hand, businesses' opportunities arising from the need to reduce uh, vulnerability are also too often overlooked. So therefore, we started this work in 2021 with the aim to broaden the understanding of climate risks uh, from the perspective of the private sector. Today, we will present the main findings in how um, business can understand their climate risks and get prepared for the risks on one hand and take the business opportunity emerging in climate science, uh, sorry, a service on the other. So climate change, 
um, plays uh, a dual role for private sector businesses, uh, either as a risk for the business um, or as a new opportunity. So as a risk, so we will look into um, the point of, uh, for example, what types of risks does climate change bring to businesses and how can private sector to understand and prepare for climate risks? In this regard, uh, Elizabeth will also introduce you a few examples of available tool for assessing your business's climate risks. Lastly, we will also talk about the influence, uh, what influences the private sector in taking adaptation action. So the second perspective is that we look if we look at climate change as a new uh, market opportunity, um, so we will cover the point as uh, um, to understand what are the new market emerging from climate adaptation demand and what helps to scale up the new businesses. And lastly, we will also um, present a few examples of business cases from different sectors. So in order to understand uh, what climate risks um, a business may face, we need to understand the element that is defining the climate risks. Um, here we refer to IPCC's definition, which um, a climate risks will depend on three elements, hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. Um, hazard is the possible physical events that may have adverse effect on your businesses. Um, exposure refers to the inventory of elements in an area uh, in which hazard events may occur. So therefore, if a business is not located in the areas with potential hazards, risks would not exist. So the last element is vulnerability, refers to the propensity of exposed elements, such as a manufacturing or other operation site, to suffer uh, effect when uh, impacted by hazard event, which also depends a lot on the individual business's capacity. Okay, so then next is to understand um, what types of climate risks does, um, does climate change bring to the businesses. According to IPCC and the TCFD, um, climate risks are grouped into two main categories. One is um, uh, physical risks, which is related to a business's uh, facilities, infrastructures, or operations. For instance, damages to your um, premises and the transport system or employee safety, or anything related to your uh, raw material and the supply chain. So to the right, um, we give a few examples of typical physical risks related to different sectors, for example, for agriculture, so it could be uh, the reduced uh, yield due to the increased temperature or reduced uh, water availability. And for renewable energies and manufacturing, so these all have different uh, physical um, risks out of uh, climate change. And uh, the other type of uh, risk is a transition risk, which is related to the transition to a lower carbon economy. Um, for example, uh, those could be policy and the legal risks, or uh, technology risks, or even market risk. And also to the right, uh, for each of the uh, for the same sectors, we also give a few examples. Which kind of transition? Which kind of typical transition risks can mean uh, for for industry? For example, for the agriculture, it could be the changes in the customer demand, and um, uh, for the manufacturing, it could be the uh, carbon pricing and so on. So we have more discussion about those uh, sets in the in the publication. Then next is to understand the potential risk level. Uh, there are already a few tools available helping the private sector, especially the SMEs, uh, in self risk assessment and to provide adaptation recommendations. Uh, we will introduce you more later. Um, but however, even when climate-related risks are uh, well understood, uh, this does not necessarily mean that uh, appropriate responses to address the potential risks will be implemented. So there are a number of factors that influence businesses 
to invest in addressing their climate risks. For example, uh, the lack of a business case for the private sector to be sure that adaptation measures will produce returns. And this is likely due to the lack of adequate pricing for potential risks, or whether information or uh, technical capacity is available for proactive adaptation actions, as well as uh, adequate uh, finance, sorry, financial service and support. And for SMEs in developing countries, um, their adaptive capacity uh, will largely depend on um, the business's size and the ownership, the uh, perception of climate risks, as well as the availability of institutional services, including uh, finance support. Um, but also, for some cases, also depending the individual uh, age and the gender and the education level of the business owners. So, Let's move to the next perspective of seeing climate change as a new market um, for climate services. As a relatively new market, researchers have summarized a few common features of this market that uh, not, uh, usually this market requires a systemic understanding of innovation and it is usually uh, knowledge uh, intensive and uh, very hard to be standardized. Uh, due to the high um, demand of uh, context information for climate service, um, it also requires close interactions between service providers and their uh, customers in order to have a tailor-made service. Okay, then to understand what sectors or industries are taking these opportunities and who are the customers of those services. We look at uh, uh, one of the database of climate service businesses provided by the UNFCCC. Um, here's some very interesting um, fact. According to the 102 cases, engineering service are the largest adaptation service provider followed by agriculture and ICT the services and around 10% of the cases introduce the business management and the finance services. And uh, furthermore, um, we can say three quarters of the 102 service providers are located in Global North. And then looking into the customer and sectors that uh, are seeking for the most adaptation service were um, water management, followed by early warning and other uh, ICT needs, um, but also agriculture and the infrastructure. Um, again, around two thirds of the customers are located in global south. So to scale up uh, the, new op the new business opportunities, um, a few recommendations have been suggested by researchers. Uh, those, cover, those cover from um, fostering the uptake by developing um, adaptation solutions locally and effectively, um, but also the diversity of business models through support of spin-offs, startups, or public-private partnerships. Furthermore, the contribution of incubation and the acceleration program uh, to stimulate market as well as to standardize the service, including um, product categories, product ratings, quality assurance were also mentioned. So now then let me hand this over to Elizabeth to introduce you a few climate risk assessment tools and examples of business case focusing on adaptation service. Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Jing Jing. I hope you can hear me, but let me know if not. Like a, so we wanted to get a practical understanding of how businesses would assess and plan for climate risks. And the best way to do that is to look at the practitioners. So practitioners like GIZ, Jan has just shared her experience with us. We looked uh, through the lens of the tools that they applied to see how do businesses really go about that? How do they analyze what they are exposed to and how do they plan adaptation strategies? In this context, we analyzed the GIZ Climate Expert as well as three other tools. Due to the time constraints of this webinar, I cannot go into it, but I do hope that you pick up the publication and study them for yourselves. 
Um, one thing that our analysis showed immediately, what we found is interesting, was that there were shared features in the tools. So a common starting point in the tools is the analysis of the context, including a company's exposure, the hazards they're exposed to, and their vulnerability to them. From there, all of the tools take a step-by-step -step approach from assessing business risks and opportunities to crafting adaptation strategies. All of the companies, uh, sorry, the tools are applicable to companies in various sectors. So the tools are sector agnostic, if you will. Um, and finally, uh, the final feature that we found was shared among the tools is that physical risks are more dominant in the consideration of all four tools. In addition to uh, shared shared features, there were also shared presumptions that the tools uh, share. So the tools all assume that businesses have at their disposal, disposal a number of resources that some companies may have, but that, for instance, companies in developing countries or micro, small and medium-sized enterprises may not have. Um, we state this not because we want it to be understood as a criticism of the tools, because they're very quite effective. But instead, we found it interesting um, that that was a shared feature in them. So one thing, for instance, that the tools presume is that companies have at their disposal veteran climate information uh, at a very granular level and, and somewhat climate projections into the future. And while arguably there's a body of information out there that is growing on regional impacts of climate change, um, increasingly downscale projections are becoming available on climate change, um, businesses might not be aware of them or how to interpret these projections for their purposes and for their planning uh, projects. Other things that were presumed to be uh, known and maybe are known in many cases, but not in all, is the cost data on or the physical impact and the cost of the adaptation measures. So the cost of action and the cost of in inaction. Finally, um, there is a certain level of knowledge and technical capacity required to use the tools, and Jan has touched upon this already in her presentation. They recommend, for instance, for the GIZ, the climate expert to, to be used in certain contexts, so with consultants or with training organizations. In addition to analyzing the tools, we also analyzed businesses, um, specifically businesses that provide a good or services that serves adaptation. I really hope you do pick up the publication and study this for yourselves because we, we found it very intriguing what is going on in some of these industries. So weather and climate information products, for instance, are a very interesting field. Um, many companies in this business use publicly available information, such as weather and climate data from meteorological or hydrological services in the countries, and then they repurpose it for commercial use by making it, uh, by putting it into a format that's accessible and user-friendly, and that's specific to an industry or a context. And that's how you, you know, you develop an app or a software or service that's really relevant for industries to plan. Index-based insurance, or as it's synonymously referred to paramedic insurance, is what uh, uh, Elliot has already touched upon. And then finally, in the publication, we also um, highlight the role that climate resilient and low carbon construction and building materials play in the embodied environment, because it's a very fascinating study of a physical manifestation of adaptation that we wanted to uh, illuminate. And it's interesting, in, within these industries, Jan early on said already, we need a strengthening of these service markets, which, which I agree with. What I found very interesting um, studying these, these industries is that um, they, they reinforce each other in, in relevance, so to speak. So on the back of a good insurance product, financial products can be developed, or with the help of weather and climate information products, better planning uh, stimulates you know, the, the, the uptake of other adaptation services. So today, what I want to conclude with is the conclusion of our presentation. There's a dual reality to climate change, um, and we, uh, in the paper, we shed light on both, on the threats and opportunities for businesses stemming from that. The paper also shows, and here I agree with Jan, that businesses are catalysts in the production and delivery of adaptation goods and services. And thus, even small businesses or businesses in, uh, in developing countries can be change agents in the, in the adaptation journey. Finally, what I would like to leave you with today is a, a working definition of adaptation as a means. This is a phenomenon that uh, that I think we we came across in our in our paper, and that this paper sort of adds to in terms of of evidence, and that was established by Sherrod Rabaki and her colleagues. 
Um, they describe adaptation as a means of companies that provide technologies, products, and services that address systemic barriers uh, and or reduce material climate risks, in short. And we found in the production of this publication that there's a growing set of companies that meet just this definition. Um, thanks to all the other participants for giving us examples of this, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, that wraps up our remarks from our presenters. Um, I would encourage the audience to, to read the paper that we will share the link in the chat box that you can download. But let's also uh, shift to the KDA a um, part of our event. Um, I will also invite our speakers to uh, turn on their camera now. Good to see you again. Um, I think we have to get some very interesting questions. Um, let me have a look. I might pick up one um, about the insurance. Um, I believe this is for you, Elliot. So whether you can tell a little bit about uh, whether any uh, worldwide strategy that try to can uh, convince um, smaller businesses to you know to take a climate insurance uh, as um, as uh, to to build the resilience. I mean, I understand this is a very big topic, um, but I'm sure with your experience involved in insurance development forum, you might have some insight you want to share with the audience. Thank you. Um, it's uh, it's indeed um, a long journey because insurance is a cost first of all. So if it's not made mandatory in uh, in your country, for instance, uh, I don't think that disaster insurance is made mandatory in any country. It's uh, included in the housing uh, habitation for flood, for instance, but, uh, but that's it. And so if you don't make it mandatory, uh, there's a lot of reluctance, of course, to, to insure. Uh, insurance is not a desirable good. You never wake up on a Saturday morning and say, let's buy an insurance uh, today. And so the ways that we, we can do this, um, we, can, uh, we can still try to, to push for insurance. Is, uh, to, I would say two things. First, get public sponsorship to build new insurance programs. Because as I think uh, Jan said, in, uh, in a lot of countries, you don't have all the necessary data uh, like this. You need to collect the data. You need to install local weather stations. You need to try to correlate the local data with, for instance, the, the local yields data to see if there's a correlation between what the satellites tell you tells you and uh, what the farmers suffer, for instance, in the case of yield insurance. And so this goes with the cost. And uh, there are some, uh, some public uh, programs trying to encourage the private players to enter this space, such as um, KFW, the, the bank, they have created a dedicated fund to encourage such programs. And uh, we have five ongoing projects with them. But of course, it's long because you need to engage with authorities as well. And, uh, and the second step, I think, is so this was upfront. It's just to design the new scheme because uh, as of now, so many new schemes, so many schemes simply do not exist. And what the, once the schemes are designed, I think that's the, the good way to encourage taking insurance is, is subsidizing part of the premiums. Uh, that's a long-standing debate uh, for international organizations because, um, uh, of course, everybody wants to fund, you know, uh, uh, concrete actions and things that are tangible and that you can see on the ground. Whereas giving money to insurers to fund their, their premiums is, uh, of course, uh, less of a, of a nice action to put forward. Uh, but we, we see that it's the main obstacle for, for the uptake of insurance is that uh, simply in some countries, the vulnerable communities do not have the means to pay. And so if there is no help from the, their government or the international community, they won't get insured. And what is funny to observe, and I will conclude there, is that even in developed countries, uh, we massively subsidize some insurance premiums. In France, if you're a farmer and you want to get insured, your premium is paid by almost uh, 70%. And so that's that's very funny to to uh, funny uh, to observe the way that the international donor community is now more and more considering to fund both the design of the programs and the insurance uh, premiums themselves. I hope that answers. Um, thank you very much, Elliot. And I think uh, in your answer, you also mentioned um, uh, the critical role about the data. 
Um, actually, I think maybe we can uh, invite Elizabeth to tell a little bit, uh, a few, maybe if you can give a few examples of companies that are providing, for example, such kind of weather and uh, climate information product as, as a data resource. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, of course, there, there are a number of examples out there of businesses that provide weather and climate information products in developing countries. So there's Ignitia, for instance, Earth Networks, um, there's the Trans-African Hydrometeorological Observation of Networks. Um, some of these are donor-funded initiatives, but others are applying a commercial model. So two well-known ones that are not just commercial, but I, I guess even corporate models is Weather Company by IBM, or the Climate Corporation by Monsanto, it's now part of Bayer. Those are two, you know, those are in the agro-industrial, those are big agro-industrial companies that acquired these companies that, that make pretty sophisticated use of weather and climate information products and to, to inform their decision-making and to plan for the, um, the agro-industrial value chain. Those would be some examples. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Maybe a following up, um, not a question maybe for you, Ian. Uh, so um, in your experience, so especially with the climate expert, uh, how did you obtain climate data for the analysis? If you can just elaborate a little bit more on that. Thank you. Yeah, as I already mentioned before, it's actually quite a challenge. Um, I think it also goes a lot with like me doing a lot of expectation management with my projects on the ground and also the companies that we work with. They always expect, you know, the whole tool to bring everything. But the truth is it's a facilitation tool. It provides a framework for analysis, but we don't bring in all the expertise and the data. But what we try to do is when we do the kickoff meeting and when we do the trainings that we invite, uh, invite like, yeah, the meteorology institutions in the country and then they do these input presentations but even then i think in most developing countries it's very hard yeah, to obtain like localized data because there's a lot of spatial difference even within countries sometimes even within the same area in a country when you have a specific microclimate um, and that makes it really challenging for us and honestly we haven't really solved this issue because we can only work with what we have and um the funds that we have at hand, they, they focus on doing, you know, like this five-step approach, but um, we usually struggle with, you know, like supporting other projects that focus on, you know, the service market for climate intelligence. Um, thank you, Yen. And uh, I think it's a very interesting discussion. I actually see uh, a relevant uh, question from the audience uh, asking, what do you think um, that uh, whether there is a role for large industry in supporting SMEs in taking actions on climate adaptation. So I think this is actually also a related topic to what we just discussed. Uh, with uh, my experience, is um, um, the the large company they can play a role in, for example, providing. Uh, providing climate information and they have the expertise, they have the infrastructures and uh, they have the network and uh, um, uh, for sure in terms of uh, providing uh, data or, or service, they can play a, um, a critical role uh, to help SMEs uh, in, for example, um, providing uh, engineering service or construction uh, service and so on. And this also shows that this is also uh, a huge opportunity for those uh, businesses uh, related to those ad adaptation needs. Um, so I think uh, all those are shows that uh, um, a private sector, they are playing, uh, I mean, a dual role here. So by um, adapt to climate, change they not only you know to uh, protect their own businesses but they also based on that can explore um potential new market and that is uh, what exactly we will try to uh, explore today uh, we don't have much time left but uh, i do have um another question and um, maybe this is i think uh, it is more related to your work elliot if you can try to give some insight um so the question is, uh, uh, could you please tell us a bit more about uh, 
uh, your experience, for example, how long does it take to design an uh, insurance product for a country or maybe for a city and so on? So um, this may be a very big question, but if you can just try to give us some. So that's a terrible question. Thank you, Zing Zing. Uh, I would say between three months and three years. Uh, the technical side of the product design is not that long because we have all our actuaries and engineers working on it. It's, it's reasonably short. What is long is what Jan said, is uh, um, engaging with the local players, engaging with the local uh, insurance industry because you don't want the products to be only placed uh, on the international market to only benefit big groups like us. You want it to be shared with the local insurers but they don't always have the financial capacity or the technical capacity to understand the product or to pay for the loss. So you need to engage with them, you need to engage with the government. Uh, so it, uh, it really depends. On the public sector side, it can go for from three months to three years, really. On the private sector side, uh, it's more like three weeks because uh, the clients knows uh, what, uh, what they want and, uh, and we are quite fast. Thank you very much, Alex. It's interesting to know that it can take from three months to even three years, I mean, for a specific um, product. Uh, very interesting. Um, okay, I think uh, we don't have more time, but we do have a few questions in the, um, on, the, on the list. We might look at that and uh, you might hear from us after the event. But anyway, I uh, would strongly encourage you to download the publication from our website. And also for your information, the record of this webinar will also be available online later. Um, so I want to use this chance to thank you all, uh, your speakers, uh, for your remarks and the great discussions. Also want to uh, take the chance to thank uh, our colleagues and the reviewers uh, who have contributed to the work. Um, and also thank our IT support colleagues sit behind this webinar to provide their support. And lastly, I really want to thank you all as an audience to, uh, for your participation uh, and very good questions from you. Um, thank you all and uh, have a nice day. Goodbye.